It's All great. right. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Elian, for the introduction. Um, yes, today is the eighth session out of 12 of this summer school on the virtual brain. And I will be talking for the next more or less two hours to you about in situ optimization of deep brain stimulation, how the virtual brain can help us do this. Um, shortly to me, I'm Jill. I'm a postdoc um, in the lab of Petra Ritter already now for two and a half years. And uh, yeah, that's also how long I've been working with TVB and deep brain stimulation. And I hope that I can today not only explain to you all the basic concepts in a slow pace, but also show you our newest work on what we are doing right now and how exciting this whole field is and yeah, what are all the gaps that one could fill in the future with new research. All right, so let's start and take you all from where you maybe know brain stimulation from. So um, all of you might know these old pictures and movies about electroshock therapy. That was of course very horrifying and we've come a long way since then. And the most, in my opinion, elegant looking device, but from the looks of it, is a Neuralink that you might have heard as well of. And that's what Elon Musk calls the Fitbit in your skull, right? So it's a tiny implant that this little pig, Gertrude, also recently got into her brain. And by activating it, it can switch behavior. And it's supposed to be a super tiny device and it's supposed to help us understand the brain and also record it, but at the same time, also manipulate it, uh, hopefully in a good way, such that we can cure diseases. And um, even though I have recently um, looked up Neuralink again and what they're doing and so on, it's not going too well, um, but that's maybe where you know it from. And now let's get to today and what we will talk about in detail. So this is the overview of the lecture. I also posted a link to the slides and Leon just posted it again, it's in a wiki collab, and it should be uh, public. And uh, if not, later after the lecture, we can all figure that out that we will get the slides. Um, so you have to take any notes or anything. Um, I see a question in the chat, but that's about exam. Okay, that will be handled then by Julie and Leon and you will get your answer. Okay, so today, what is deep brain stimulation? That will be our first point. Um, if you don't know what it is yet, or if you already know, then I will show you what I mean with it by it and how we can basically uh, simulate it then. And we can simulate it on different levels and different scales. And we will start simulating it in just the medial TVB simulation. And you will also do it yourself on eBrain. So last week you already needed this eBrain's account. Now it's even more important. Um, but don't worry, there's also the notebook in this wiki collab, and you can just download the notebook, uncomment the pip install commands of TVB, and you can run it anywhere on your computer. It will just install locally TVB. I will come to that in more detail, just so you know, both options are totally fine. Then we'll go and we'll do a more realistic simulation of brain, deep brain stimulation, and we will do it with TVB multiscale. Last week, Dennis uh, talked a lot to you about the specifics of TVB multiscale, all the details of how it works. And today we will basically see the first use case of it, which is also related to the reading material for this course, which is a recent paper where we use TVB multiscale to in silico optimize the brain simulation. So now you know where the title is coming from. And then C is how can we improve this simulation in the, free, in the future because we are not completely there yet. We want to do individual optimization. We want to do it for lots of different patient groups and we want to have it, let's say, modeling assisted. So um, I will point out a few things what we are doing right now and I will also show what others are doing and how yeah, new and exciting stuff is coming out every day about this field basically. So um, what other neuromodulation therapies can we simulate? There are actually a lot more that we can do. And then our group ongoing is already TMS and TDCS uh, stimulation. Simulation. So these are other things we can also simulate with the virtual brain. All right, so I am looking forward to do the first things with you for the first hour more or less. And then there will be a break in between the TV multi-scale part and then we'll go on. 
and leave room for questions in the end, but also, of course, in the chat that I will keep in mind here. Okay, so first of all, what is deep brain stimulation? Um, you, um, a patient, so far no healthy volunteers, only patients get implanted to DBS electrodes. So DBS is just a short abbreviation for deep brain stimulation and that will be connected via a, ca uh, a cable and have like a pacemaker implanted in another surgery shortly after, which is here in the um, shoulder sh chest area implanted. Um, where the device is taking all the, the battery from. And then where is this actually implanted, these electrodes? There, are, for Parkinson's disease, the uh, yeah, most popular uh, target at the Charité at the moment is the STN, which is a subthalamic nucleus. It's really a tiny area of the brain deep inside the skull, um, inside the basal ganglia areas, which is abbreviated with STN. And there will be then these contacts of the, um, we call it the DBS lead. And these contacts will provide a stimulus to the surrounding tissue, which will at first inhibit all activity and then reactivate it. And there's lots of discussion of how exactly this mechanism is, but it seems to be working for quite a lot of um, treatments. So it's actually an established treatment option that leads to significant improvement of motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease, as I already said, but also dystonia and essential tremor. So really, we seem to be able to control with this stimulus the motor um, abilities of patients, which is kind of amazing, right? We, there's this huge brain, but at a very local place, we give really some milliampere stimulus and then it will propagate and will change uh, the whole movement of the whole body if for example you're tremoring a lot and then it will stop the tremor and of course because it was so successful and still is um, people have tried it on different other diseases like OCD, depression, Tourette syndrome, Huntington's disease, addiction, Alzheimer's disease, pain, chronic pain and many others and it is actually quite uh, successful there as well but not yet fda approved and also not in the eu so it's coming up and up but we need of course good validations we need a good sense of what's happening in the brain and we want to also circumvent that there are patients which go through this treatment meaning they get surgery on the on the brain right so it takes like maybe up to two hours uh, with lots of measurements before after then they need to calibrate the electrode what exact frequency, what pulse um, should be programmed, what's the best setting of the stimulus for the patient. And then afterwards, there's still some patients who actually see also sometimes worsening of their symptoms. So that's what we don't want, of course. So we need to understand it better. And that's where modeling can come in to predict individual optimal targets for deep brain stimulation before even doing the surgery. So we will try to do um, is to use the virtual brain and we will move the diseased brain in this 3D dynamical uh, state space, hopefully with the virtual brain already in the healthy state. So then we can see diseased brain functioning and we can see diseased firing activity, but then using the virtual brain and using in the in our modeling world already the right setting that we can already see this brain could potentially be moved here towards healthy target functioning again. And that's a bit of the, let's say the image you should keep in mind today of what we are trying to do. We're trying to move the brain in state space, in dynamical system state space, towards a healthy functioning again, healthy firing rates, healthy connections and interaction on the brain. So here you can see what, one often sees when you're looking into DBS literature is that when you take 20 patients here, um, for example, and you afterwards check where was the electrode implanted, then you can see it's all over the place surrounding the STN, but sometimes also outside the STN, right? So they don't often hit the target that well. There is during the surgery, a lot of placement strategy going on. They are um, starting with very tiny electrodes, putting them in before they put the final lead. And they are trying to find this abnormal activity that they want to suppress the stimulus. And then they place the real electrode there. And afterwards, 
after the surgery, it's very hard to alter anything of the placement. So when one figures out it's not the right placement for this patient, there is not much one can do, unfortunately. But it also shows us that there is a lot of individual vari variability that we should take into account. And that in the modeling world, we can take into account before the surgery, maybe. And here you can see that um, there are red and blue fibers marked here for the STN DBS for Parkinson's disease. And this study by Horn had found out that the electrode um, will be. Um, yes, so that's the electrode. Um, so there is a question in the chat. Uh, you try TV before simulating. I have two pages. Okay, both of the motor for the motor symptoms. So I will read it out because if it's on YouTube. So there's a question. Um, I had two patients with DBS, both with Parkinson's disease, and it works very well for the motor symptoms. Thanks for the comments. It's uh, glad to hear that this is true in practice. Um, you tried TVB for simulating? No, they didn't try TVB yet, just the clinical management. What's the standard procedure? The TVB is uh, not yet there. We are working towards making it available for clinicians as well. Uh, but first of all, we need to validate, validate, validate our own models that we are sure that what we are suggesting, the settings that we are suggesting, are the settings that are best for the patient, right? So you be really sure in the modeling world that it works and it works for large cohorts before you go towards um, using modeling assistant uh, clinical therapy. So what I wanted to say about the fibers here is that the electrode, once it activates the red fibers, this was done after all of these patients got the electrodes implanted, and they looked at the fibers activated. When the red fibers were activated, they actually saw that this is an improvement in the clinical symptoms. But when the blue fibers were activated by the electrodes, just a few millimeters next to it, so the electrode is placed just a little bit um, outside this area that we want to, the blue fibers are activated and they can even lead to some clinical worsening of the motor symptoms of the Parkinson patient. So it's not what we want, right? So we need to better understand and model and see if we can assist somehow in the clinical practice with that. So what's the current state of actually the underlying mechanism is not yet understood of the brain stimulation. There are lots of hypotheses about there are lots of models lots of models uh, dealing with this problem already. And all of these models are actually targeting often different scales. So you see it, it's definitely a multi-scale problem. You have the scale just around the electrode. You wanna know really what's going on there. You see that millimeters matter there. Um, as the lab from Andreas Horn always says, and then you have the other scale that you see sometimes some slurring in language or something. So you see things happening from the clinical perspective in areas much further away from this surgical target, which then means that it also affects other areas of the brain and it affects other capabilities of this patient. So it, it affects quality of life of this patient, more like a whole brain scale. So we thought, let's build a multi-scale model that bridges these different scales, that combines the things that we know from the spiking world, from the single neurons, from the things around the electrode, let's combine it with the whole brain modeling of TBB to see what's going on in, uh, at both scales and have one model that combines it. So um, now let's look at to the, into this uh, quite cute, I know, um, vision picture that we have, which I talked about already and that you can see here just visualized that we think when a patient comes in, a Parkinson's disease patient gets a structural MRI and has no DBS implant whatsoever, we hope that we can use the virtual brain together with this functional data where we will validate that we really have the virtual brain as close as possible to his realistic empirical brain data. And we will go back and forth here to adjust the parameters and to make sure that the virtual brain is as close as possible to the real brain in terms of signal. And then we will use our high performance clusters and to optimize treatment in silico to test out the different treatments, right? So when a, you have to imagine that when the patient is going through a surgery afterwards, 
there will be some months of recovery and then afterwards uh, it needs to be calibrated, it needs to be programmed, the electrode, which we call DBS programming. And what, how is that done? So the patient sits and uh, the doctors, they try to find the right settings, they test out different things, but it's, it's a limited time in the session always, right? So you will spend a couple of hours with the patient, then you will send the patient home with the best setting, you think so. But it could be that after a few weeks, the patient says, it's not actually helping. I, I feel it better at first, now it's not, so I would like to readjust. And this process cannot go up to years um, using a lot of time for the patient and also the neurologist who has to sit in every session with the patient. And there are so many possibilities of how to set these electrodes that you can easily be overwhelmed. And you need a lot of intuition these days as a clinician to find the right treatment. And people of, were, are also very honest in saying that in most of the cases we might miss the optimal setting. So we imagine that high performance cluster power that we have, for example, with eBrains can be used to just try out the different settings together with some machine learning where we find the optimal solution quite fast and can see, okay, now we have the happy patient and we have the right medication, the right settings for the electrode for each individual. All right, so that was already the first part. And now let's go on and see how would we simulate this? Because that's the part why you're here for, not to learn from me about clinical things, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm a mathematician, by the way. So I don't know much about the clinical practice um, other than the last kind of 10 years in neuroscience. Okay, so let's refresh and recap what you've heard over the last lectures, because I know sometimes, you know, summer can get quite interesting and you can get carried away from the course and maybe not watch the videos every week altogether. So what's the virtual brain? We have an input as you've learned in the first two lectures. We need a matrix of weights and the matrix of stretch lengths for the virtual brain to have all the data that it would need. How do we get that? We normally get that just by an MRI scan that consists of a DTI and we will use parcellation to distinguish different areas in the brain we will calculate the tract length and the weights between those areas to create our connectome. So the connectome goes in and what comes up? Different things can come out of the virtual brain in terms of what we call monitors, which are um, yeah, different signals that you can extract from your simulation. You can send your signals through, um, for, for example, often the balloon wind castle model, and what will come out is a bold signal that is comparable to an fMRI, for example, resting state signal. You can have signals of EEG or MEG, or we can even extract signals that are at the level of the local field potential, right? So for every region, we get out also the neural time series. So we know what the neurons are doing or virtual brain, and we can extract that information, maybe compare it with the area that the local field potential that measured that is measured by this uh, DBS electrode. So different inputs and outputs of the virtual brain are possible. And then what's, how does the virtual brain work? Just a very short recap. You have different areas then, you have their connections. So you have this beautiful connectome or brain network. And then you will put on every one of these dots a mean field model in the classical version of the virtual brain. What's mean field is nothing else that an average um, activity of all the neurons in that area. So you have to imagine like this birds, right? And then you don't want to model every single bird or every single neuron, but what you want to model is kind of only the average because oh, even if you just see the average, so this red cross moving across the sky, you will have quite a good idea of what's happening to all of the birds and where they are. And if that's what you want to know, then maybe an average model can help you. So the mean field model or average activity model is placed onto every region. And that means that every region is not more with every single neuron, but with populations of neurons. So one level higher up. And here, for example, I use one Wang model by Deco et al and from 2014. And each region model with an inhibitory population and an excitatory population. And you see that they're interacting with each other and these interactions are described here with differential equations. Um, don't get scared by these equations, right? Differential equations are just equations that describe 
the current state of the system, if you would give that in, how is it developing in the next time step, right? So a differential equation is just giving us the next time step for the variables that we are interested in, which can be synaptic activity, it can be membrane potential, it can be firing rate. All of these things will come back again and again when you're dealing with these um, mean field models inside the virtual brain. And there are many to choose from, but the global equation always looks like this. So as I said, first this is an, the differential equation. So it maps the system onto its next time state, onto its derivative. And then they have a neural mass model, which is the same as the mean field model that will describe how your state variable, maybe firing rate that you're interested in, is going from one time step to the next. So firing rates, field potentials, and so on. And then what comes, if we would only do this, we would have a system that's uncoupled. Every region would do its own, but we don't, we think that's not true for the brain. We actually know it's not true for the brain. The brain is a connective structure. It's a network. So what we need is a global, what we have is global coupling. Global coupling in the sense that all of the regions are wired together by the connectome. And we can scale that wiring by taking this factor G into account. So if G is really high, you will have high connectivity uh, in your brain. If your G is low, you have a low connectivity in your brain. And then the wiring comes from the connectome, as I said, and that's described here by this structural connectivity matrix, also called connectome and also called long range coupling, which are the white matter fiber tracts in your brain. And then we always take into account a certain delay. We don't assume that one region is instantaneously sending everything to the others. Then we would have an ultra fast brain, right? And super intelligent people. No, there's a day. Sometimes you need to wait a second to remember something, right? That's exactly what comes in here. So these are the time delays that are basically in the virtual brain calculated from track lengths. And the track lengths that were, are the actual lengths of the tracks in between two regions. So if you have a long track, a long time delay, and the signal will come a little bit later to the neighboring region. Okay, then you have a thing called local connectivity, which is optional in the virtual brain, because we know the brain is not only wired with those long white matter fiber tracks, but also what's happening in your direct surroundings for a brain region, what's happening to your neighbors, it's also important, and they are also interacting with each other. So that's something that you would need when you, the, sorry, the local connectivity is something only that you would need when you want to simulate surface-based simulations. Everything else is region-based simulations. So what's surface-based is just that you don't model every region with a mean field model, but every tiny voxel on your skull, on your surface, is uh, modeled with a mean field model. So many more, like thousands, right? Where we normally are satisfied with 360 regions. All right, and now it comes to the part that we will talk about today, which is the injected input to the virtual brain. That's something that we will use today to inject the stimulus. And you see it's just additive in the equation. So when we add this directly, there will be a direct effect in our model. And of course, never forget to put in some noise because that makes it more realistic. Okay, so uh, how is it looking when you simulate with the virtual brain uh, STM stimulation? And these are all the regions visualized of the basal ganglia. So the surrounding regions of the STM. You can see the tiny region of the STN firings, and you can see on the right the signals. And this is the graphic interface of the virtual brain. This is just an example. It's not yet tuned to anything. It's just to show you, okay, when it starts somewhere, it will propagate to the neighboring regions, this global coupling that we have in our model. Everything is connected. And then it can propagate to anywhere, but in this case, only those areas were actually modeled. Okay, this is just to show you how it will look if you do it yourself. And this is to complete the whole picture. If you're now thinking like, mm, deep brain stimulation, not my favorite thing, it's okay. Uh, the same mechanism you can use 
and model medicine effects. You can model TMS, you can model TDCS. It's all based on the same principles. And it's um, the same approach that you would follow also to optimize uh, the settings for the brain for an individual patient in any other therapy. Okay, so let's start and see a hands-on tutorial of the stimulus propagate. So do exactly what we've just seen with the graphical user interface, but now for the whole brain. And since given a similar course before, It's quite smooth. And I encourage you to look at the code because that's something that we haven't that might be more new to you. So let's do a hands on tutorial on eBrains and do some step-by-step -step process of how we would define a stimulus, how we would then apply the stimulus to a region-based simulation, and then how we would visualize the result. And hopefully each one of you will have those beautiful brains and see how the stimulus effect would propagate over the brain, right and left hemisphere, and so on. All right, so let's see. Okay. Um, we need to go to this address, sorry, uh, wiki.ebrains.eu and so on. That's our collab that I already posted in the chat and Leon also posted in the chat. So that let's click on this link. Let's log in with your eBrain credentials in case you have some and then follow my steps. So if you can't follow my steps right now, it's everything is also in the slides. So you can also just go through it on your own in the slides or go back and forth. The slides are also there. Okay, let me do it. I go to this address that I can also, yeah, it was reposted. Thank you for that. And then on the left, if you go to this collab on eBrains to the drive, you can see everything that I put in there, which are the slides and download. And then also, the notebook that you can either download and run locally, or if you have an eBrains account and, I, and were added to the TBB group, you can just click here, say I copy this, because if you don't copy it to your own library, see, copy my library, then your changes will not be saved. And that's sometimes unfortunate. For now, it would be not too bad if you just open it directly. But when you want to make bigger changes, you want to play with it, it's good to put it to your own library. You have seen this process before, I guess, so it's fine. So when we then go to lab and we say, we want to open lab now in a different tab because then you can see the whole process. You have to um, choose a supercomputing center. Julich is so, in Germany, I'm close. Hi, so, Jill. Yeah. Uh, Julie, ah, yeah. uh, uh, so the folder on eBrains is on private, not on public, no? so we okay. cannot access this. Okay, and you are not members of the course and you will not have access to the lab, I already can say. But um, uh, how can I make it? It's very easy, I guess, to make it public. I just give me a second. Good that you mentioned this, Julie. No, it's a participant. <laughs> oh, or even a participant. Great. Yes. I know it was like a one step thing. Ah, here. Yeah. Ta see. Okay, should be solved. Try to go at it again. Go to the drive. Download the slides if you like. Sorry that I didn't put it before. It works for me, really... so it will yeah. work for the participant too now. Thank you. Perfect, Jill. perfect. Yeah, thanks for mentioning it directly. Uh, the chat, uh, I should put it bigger here. 
All right, so great. And um, if you are there and you can now see it, you copy to your library, to my library, then you can go to lab, you can open the lab in a new tab, which I just did. You can choose your supercomputing center. I have not yet experienced the difference. <laughs> and then you see here, this is, I'm now in the shared folder and you can open the notebook here, but your changes will not be saved. So let's try to go drive and then my library and see if I have a notebook there. Yes, I have like 10 because I copied it 10 times. You will hopefully see one called virtual course brainstorm 16th August, 2022. And then click on it, open it. And for me, it's already open. That's why I just switched that. I was too afraid that will, there would be no server if we do it all together. All right, so now you have it open, hopefully. If not, don't worry, you can download as well and locally open it. Go in the terminal to the folder where you are. Then you type in Jupyter Notebook. And if you have that all, it will pop up a window with the Jupyter Notebook. And then you might want to uncomment it, install, if you are running it now for the first time, because it still needs to install TVB data and the TVB library to get the connect homes that we want. So I will now run everything. And run. And then run all cells. Let's see if everything works. And I just uncommented now so that if you see the requirement already satisfied for you, it will install TVB and everything. You import now a bunch of stuff. And now let's define our first stimulus. So where is the drive on the link? Okay, on the left side, drive. If you click on the link, then on the left side, there's drive. Okay, and then everything is also on the slides. So you managed to see the slides, it's first success. Um, all right, so let's define our first stimulus. For Before defining, we want to just load the default connectivity of TVB with 76 regions which you do just by calling this command, connectivity, connectivity from file. Then we want to define the stimulus. So here we define a weighting, not to be confused with weights or anything. This weighting is a vector where you can have all zeros now, now just 76 zeros, giving you all 76 regions will not have any stimulus. Um, but then you can set the stimulus of this, for example, region 12 to 0.1. So that means that the region 12 will receive the stimulus and the strength will be 0.1. It's just our first toy stimulus. There's no actual amplitude or something here. You will see that in a second. Uh, you can also, as you see here, also put and do the stimulus, make the stimulus go towards uh, multiple regions, even with the same weighting or different weightings however you want to weight your stimulus. Whichever region you want to target, you can just change the numbers of the regions here. Then the temporal profile of the stimulus, we will use the standard stimulus called pulse train in TVB, which is an actual pulse train, just pulses after each other. And it will have an onset at 1,500 milliseconds. It will have a T of 1,000, we will see in a second what that is, and a tau of 50. So then um, it's an equation inside TDB that you can look up as well. It's also in the GUI, nicely explained, by the way. And then you set your stimulus um, with this function. You say, let's use this connectivity, let's use this weighting, let's use this equation that I just defined and configure it. Um, when we then configure the stimulus, we can also plot it. So you can see that I, from the spatial component of the stimulus here, there's uh, there's just one region receiving 0.1 of the stimulus, which is correct. And then you can see it's a pulse train and my, uh, it's assuming not such a long simulation. So you can only see one pulse here at 1,500 milliseconds because I set 
um, this to 1000. So it will wait for another 1000 until it gives a new pulse. So let's not be too bothered by that for now and just say, oh, nice, we have to find one pulse. And this is like a spatial temporal plot that I don't think it's the nicest to understand. But for all you have to know is that we give now a pulse on to this region. Then we want to simulate. And we will use very basic model for now because we focus on the stimulus, the so generic 2D oscillator. We will have standard coupling, we'll have horn stochastic integrator, and we'll just look at the temporal average, which is just a monitor um, monitoring the neural activity of each of the regions. And this is the line that changes when you have seen other TDB simulation pro, um, programmings before you may not have seen this line. And here is where we define our, as a stimulus, take our just defined stimulus. If we leave that out, we have a resting state simulation. If we put it in, we have a stimulus in our simulation. And then we want to plot the result of the simulation. And you can see here, that at 1,500, first we have a transient, we always have that. And at 1,500, it starts to have some big outliers here, which is probably our region that is getting activated very strongly by this stimulus. All right, this is not looking too nice. So I put some code here from John Griffiths that has put it on, um, who has put it on his GitHub, which I'm gladly using to define some functions for plotting this nicer on the brain, as I promised. So just execute the cell that will define all the functions that you need. And then we want to visualize it on the brain. But there is one downside to this function. You will need a surface because you want to see it nicely on the surface. What TVB will need is to have the information when I have that region, where do I put it in the visualization? Where on the surface is that region? So for that, like, luckily, we also have in TVB some connectivities which already have this information, which is called the region mapping. So mapping the regions to the surface. And for that, all we have to load is the default cortex and define the region mapping data. Um, you probably don't even know need that, but to configure it, let's put it there. Um, and then you will have defined yourself a surface that we now can color. So then we put in from this, starting from the surface, this cortex, we put in and we want to see the times just after the stimulus onset, 1,505 milliseconds and in steps of five, I just wanted to zoom into this moment and see how the stimulus propagates. And you will give it the results of our simulation and you hopefully should see some nice patterns occurring here, where you see that our region 12 is, actually, I don't know which region, how they're called. I knew that before, sorry, totally spaced out. We can check region labels and find out. It's a good task for you. And uh, you can see that it was one region, but you can see that multiple regions are reacting towards the stimulus and it's going over both hemispheres. It seems to have even like a symmetric pattern that occurs here. So now what can we do with that? That's a basic setup. We can simulate on a different area, right? So let's go up and I show you the place that we change the weighting here, for example. And we say, instead of just region 12, take now and I totally randomly chose these regions of 1452, 11 and 49. And let's execute from there again, define a stimulus, we can plot the stimulus. Now in the plot, you will see four regions getting a stimulus, but the stimulus shape is the same. If we now plot the results, we can see there's even more happening. The red is the average, and all the black lines are on top of each other, and they're all showing a single region's activity. And then let's visualize again. So just execute the following cells. I didn't change anything else. And see, it takes a moment. If we now see a different propagation of that stimulus. Tada, looks completely different, right? We, it makes sense. We stimulated more areas and now we have more areas reacting stronger to the stimulus. 
and you can play with that for hours. Yeah, trust me, I, I did that. It's, it's, I, I think it's quite fun, but uh, you need to be into it, of course. Um, then you can be, go and get even more crazier if you say, I'm not satisfied with one stimulus because there are two DBS electrodes. I want them to send different pulses at different times, right, for example. So let's define the class multi-stimuli on different regions, which is already part of the TVB pool box, but I put it here that we can see it. And let's again load our connectivity. And then let's make different trains of stimulus. You see here is a green one and a yellow one. And they will be put on different regions. So two regions will receive this pulse, 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 and two others will receive much shorter pulses. Okay, and now we have again defined our stimulus which we will just we just call stimulus again for convenience i should do that by the way but this is easier that i can now go up and just find the simulation again just define myself multiple stimuli and i'll just start from here executing again the simulation just because i didn't want to put too much code oh and you can see okay if we have multiple stimuli, there's a lot of stuff going on. It looks quite different. It changes all the average as well, all the red lines. So let's see how it looks. It should look massive. Again, we just execute. And we wait. Okay, maybe not so surprising to you, but I always like to see it, that now we have excited uh, the whole brain kind of, with just giving a stimulus to four regions. So you can already see how connected this uh, default connectivity in TVB is with the default setting. That's both hemispheres, uh, frontal, temporal regions. Um, you see everything lighting up more or less in the few seconds, milliseconds, just after the stimulus onset. All right, and you can go on and define whatever you want here. And I put what I left in here as a homework exercise that was from a um, course a couple of uh, years ago, I think. Um, that could be fun for you to do to really understand the concept and have a first success. Because here I, um, <clears throat> I basically changed the weights a bit of our connectivity matrix and said, okay, now it's not healthy anymore. It's a patient. And we are trying to cure this patient and I'm defining what is the variable we should look out for. And then you can just read it at home and see, and this is connectivity matrix or her of this patient that you can just find, try to find the right stimulus, maybe do like a small exploration of different areas being stimulated, of different amplitudes, of, of different strengths of this pulse train, maybe even use another stimulus than the pulse train and try to figure out for this patient what is making him as close as possible to our healthy target state again. It's of course very artificial, but it gives you already a good impression on the idea of how it's supposed to look like. And when we do it for the real patients and with the real DBS electrode stimulus, so we would get. All right, so this is all in the slides as well. And then I'm well on time to go back and see now how we simulate a bit more realistically because this was nice right you could do it yourself and in the next part there will be a break and now we want to move on and we want to see how we can make this simulation now more and more realistic and we would use for that tvb multi-scans all right so reminder what's the multi-scale version of it it's a multi-scale model bridges different scales makes sense it, which scales are we talking about when we say TVB multi-scale here? We talk about the spiking networks, which really is recording single spikes of single neurons. And we talk about the whole brain activity, which we can, for example, measure in reality with fMRI, where you can see real big chunks, like large red areas lighting up. So we try to bridge those two scales with a multi-scale model. So for some regions, we will have regional activity and for some regions we will have spiking activity coming out of that region so then 
when you want to do that, you always need to look for models, the right models, and the most fitting models on both scales. So, luckily, our collaborators, which um, were working on, with us on this um, in Chemnitz, they have developed um, the Artificial Neural Network Architect, or short Anarchy, which is a modeling software, um, maybe you know Nest from last week, right? And Anarchy was also talked about by Dennis. So it's a modeling software, TVB modalities, and this software models the spiking activity. And they have used this uh, particular model of the basal ganglia regions, which is here GPE, GPI, thalamus, STN, you see that coming back, and the striatum. And they have uh, also modeled the cortex, but in a different way than we are used in the TVB world to model the cortex. They have used for the cortex just 600 excitatory neurons and 150 inhibitory neurons. So they treated the cortex like one region. And then they tuned this model for individual Parkinson's disease patients. So you see, we don't have all the regions of the brain when we have important ones around the electrodes. And they had fMRI data of these Parkinson patients. And they optimized the weights and probabilities for all of these errors inside this network for each individual patient. So they became individual weights. And then how did they do it? Because they always validated and checked if it fits with the fMRI activity. So they optimized it and got out same fMRI activity as in reality for Parkinson's disease patients using resting state fMRI. Um, so that was a great starting point for us. We said, oh, so it seems for the regions around the electrode, which is the crucial area where we want the higher resolution scale, and we already have a model that's optimized for patients, Parkinson's disease patients and controls. So great, let's take that model. But we have the second perspective on the multi-scale uh, which is the whole brain activity as well. So we have cortical excitatory neurons and cortical inhibitory neurons, but for every region, right? So we replace their cortex with the virtual brain cortex, which is an excitatory population on every region of the cortex. And it's modeled with mean field activity. And the lower part, we modeled in anarchy, and this uh, framework, TPB anarchy, was developed, as you heard last week, but from Dennis, um, that they can talk to each other, these two scales. And how they do it is via these proxy nodes, right? And we have, we can tune this interface a bit. We have these three variables, W, uh, normalized Ws, which we call the interface factors in uh, the paper related to this work. And we tune them, so all translation from one activity to the other, because that's still an open research question, right? How is spiking directly related to mean field yeah okay so what you can see here is how the model looks like that we used it's it's a bit more realistic because we have higher resolution here here we really have single neurons we have spike trains and here we stay with the perspective of every region gets a mean field model okay and we call this a multi-scale model um, where the basal ganglia has a higher resolution all right so what comes out of this model. And as I said, this is also the reading material for this week, right? It's our most recent paper that I will explain now in more detail. Of the upper part, you know what comes out. We have the firing rate here, for example, in Hertz, of all the regions of the virtual brain. So this is average activity of firing of the whole region. But at the same time, we have for the region surrounding the electrode, what comes out are single spikes for all of these 200 neurons. So this here is a raster plot, if you don't know it. And uh, these are six raster plots, by the way. And then you can see on the y-axis is every single neuron. These are 200 always. And when you see a tiny little dot here, it means that this neuron is firing. So when you see like a black bar, like here for the thalamus, as a reaction to the red stimulus, by the way, but we come to that in a second then it's synchronized firing. All these neurons are firing at the same time. And the model that we used here, I forgot to say that, was the reduced Wang Wang model that I've talked about earlier for the cortex. And this is used uh, the Izikovich model, 
which is quite a standard model that has a huge repertoire of different activities that it can produce for us. And uh, all the parameters were set differently in different regions. So it made it quite realistic that every region is behaving a bit differently and according to what was found in literature, different spiking behaviors of these regions. Okay, so you can see on this model, two things come out. And these, now the question is, of course, how do they exactly communicate with each other? How do we send that info to this? And how do we send that info to this? And I know that Dennis explained to us, oh, sorry, I have another question. What was the first target for the stimulus? If you mean in our study, um, we checked two targets, the STM as well as the GPI. Um, I know that at Charité, they're operating a lot on STM, but on the, in other centers, they are also testing the GPI for Parkinson's disease patients as a potential target. Thanks for your question. And we have another question. How much is this approach sensitive to the model parameters? That's a really good question. And at the moment, actually, we are trying to find that out even more. So we have lots of parameters here. If we look at this model, uh, we have the parameters here optimized. In this spiking network, they are all optimized. Um, if you look into the original in my et al. paper where we took this optimized network from, they have checked literature and they have also checked the fMRI empirical data and set the parameters for that. So it's really optimized in the sense that this will give out fMRI signal that is realistic for even fitting with the individual patient. So these parameters were in our study kind of set. We only tuned these parameters, these interface factors, because the two scales still need to talk to each other in a realistic way that we don't have over excitation here, but we drive this network in a realistic manner. So I didn't wanna go into too much detail here on how we exactly build up this network, but uh, shortly we, replace the cortex by all the regions right but there was an intermediary step that we uh, that we did where we said okay we want to drive it with a prosonian spike train the network and not with this cortex anymore so we did an intermediary model which still had the spiking and was still is or was already inside tvb but had only this one cortical region and then we said we want to get the all the firing rates as close as possible to the firing rates that produce this empirical bold, right, which we wanted to have. So the parameters here were the interface factors, the global coupling that was set, that's this one value of G, right, and uh, the reduced one one was left quite on itself with the default parameters. And with that model, we showed different things that I will come to in a second. So what we of course found out is that it highly depends on some of those parameters, some more, some less, Right, so um, now I'm get, yeah, let me first answer this question. So uh, in the follow-up study that we're pursuing right now, we're exploring these parameters that say more rigorously because this study was the first proof of concept study that we can use multi-scale simulations that it seems to produce realistic firing behavior, but then we need to do more. We need to explore more. We need to explore more the different parameters of the electrode. We need to zoom in a bit more and so on. So it was like a showcase saying, hey, TVB is there to use. And uh, it seems to make sense. And now we are exploring the dependency on all the parameters with the high performance clusters. Um, so far, it seems all still okay. We were in reasonable ranges. But you can, of course, always do better and you can always be more precise and catch more individual variability by setting your parameters of users. So we tend to stay with one or two parameters with TVB to optimize. But when you have good justification, you can go even further and when you have good computing power. But you need a good interpretation. You cannot just say oh, every parameter goes from zero to 1000. That's not making sense. Um, okay, another question. I asked the target in the notebook that you showed in the first example. Thank you. Um, the notebook that I showed, the target was the region number 12. And all you would have to do is put in con.region labels to see all the region labels and then find your 12th region label. Actually, it's Python. So it's your 13th region label. 
because it starts at zero. Um, so easy for you to find out as the homework. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. So now I talked a lot. It, I talked a lot anyways, but <laughs> I talked a lot about uh, the methods of the paper. Um, I will go and explain a bit more the details of the method. We will take then a break before the exciting results. Okay. So the TVB to energy coupling, how would how was that function? You've seen this like a couple of times before. So now I try to make it uh, specific for our use case. What comes from TVB is mean field activity, right? In this case, is a rate, a firing rate. And what these spiking neurons can receive are only spikes, right? So we need to put a firing rate and convert it to spikes. And for that, we use a spike generator, which is a device that is generating spikes, having the same rate as the rate coming in, right? So firing at the same rate. Um, and it's generating spikes for us to then be transferred to STN and the striatum that are receiving those spikes from cortical region. In the other way around, it's even more simple. We have spikes in our spiking network and we want to send them to TVB. So how do we do that? It's very simple. You just have to count the spikes per time interval and you will get yourself a rate. Tana. Okay. So it doesn't look that exciting in this use case. It seems rather straightforward. You will monitor the spikes, you will count the spikes, and you have yourself a spike rate that can be then transferred to all other TVB connections of that node. So when I talk about these connections, now the important uh, question is, so how do you define those connections? You talked about individual links in the basal ganglia, but there's the whole rest of the brain. So how do you do it? And we didn't have data for individual connectomes. So we used a normative connectome for the rest of the brain based on the publication of Peterson et al. 2019, which is still quite up-to-date atlas of how the basal ganglia is connected to the cortical regions. And they used his, his histological data, they used DTI, so lots of MRI data. They also used holographic vision, which is quite fun if you want to check out this publication, of uh, expert neuroanatomists that were there with those virtual reality glasses and deciding and looking whether a connection was probably a false positive, false negative, and how they have seen through their experience in surgeries these connections going and what their intuition is about. So it's quite a mixture of methods used to get to a good idea of what's happening on the connection between the basal ganglia and the brain. That's what we used it for. And here above, as you see for the basal ganglia network, we use individual fitted networks of the basal ganglia from the publication previously from Maid et al. So here were the regions of the basal ganglia and their connectivity, and we kind of plugged them in to the larger connector. So it's like a hybrid connectivity, right? So there's a part that's individual, and there's another part that's normative. And it seems to work. And I will show you how. This is a video of our results, where first you can see for the patient here resting state activity, where you see some regions lighting up. And here, oh, I clicked at the wrong thing. So you first have to watch the resting state. Now the electrode is implanted. So our stimulus is given. That's the starting point of the stimulus. And you can see that some areas you see much brighter colors. What does bright mean? Here it's more activity. And not only at the region of the STN and the surrounding tissue, but you can see also lots of frontal regions lighting up. So what we found was an effect, not only to the basal ganglia of our simulated stimulus, but also to regions much further away. And before we dive into these results, we will make and take a break. Yes, it's time for a break. And we will see each other again at 17.40. I will put that in the chat. And have some fresh energy to then look at the results of the paper. And the finishing part will then be an outlook on other works of uh, neuromodulation simulation and uh, going to other techniques and see how this in the future will probably play out, which are the main findings and so on. So see you in seven minutes at 17.40 Berlin time. Thanks.
All right, welcome back, everybody. So we just looked at a video of the results. And of course, in this video, uh, the results of our recent paper. Um, and in this video, it, I would be surprised if you can already see all the results there. So we, of course, prepared um, some nice plots of these results where you can see more analytically what's happening. So one uh, result that was important to get was, of course, a validated spiking network. See that once we put the spiking network inside TBB multiscale and we get spiking activity out of TBB multiscale, which is, uh, this is the first use case of it, right? That it ha it's, um, it's realistic. It's what we already would see if we would use other spiking networks and other spiking simulators. So we looked at the spiking regions, which was the striatome, the STN, GP, DPI, and the thalamus. And we know that the thalamus is really, really important for Parkinson's disease because it's probably where the whole disease is taking its, its, is taking its uh, turning point and where we want to do and change something. Such that the basal ganglia, uh, where the thalamus is the output of, is better communicating with the cortex and leading towards motor improvement. So what we have seen in our simulations are now we have tried different scenarios. We have simulated on one control, healthy control subject, one patient and both first for resting state. And then the patient we tried simulating in, at GPI region and also at STN. And at the STN region, we also tried two different stimuli one monophasic and one biphasic one. And they look like this. So what's a monophasic stimulus? And the name gives it away. It's a stimulus like our pulse train, which has uh, one phase. It's just here, the down phase of the stimulus. So then there's, this can actually be uh, damaging to the surrounding tissue if you would do that in a patient with a real DBS electrode. So what's um, in practice used is a biphasic stimulus, which ha is having two phases. First an up phase and then a regulating down phase that's coming shortly after to not damage the surrounding tissue and keep everything intact, but at the same time have a similar effect. So in practice, they use biphasic stimulus. And in other simulation studies that we have looked at, they often use this monophasic stimulus because it's easier to simulate and easier to understand what it's doing to our simulation. So we decided to use both and see what's happening. And what was happening, especially to the thalamus, was that we saw in the control a higher firing rate of the thalamic region than in the patient, Parkinson's disease patient. But when we switched on the electrode virtually, we saw that the bars were coming up again, and that actually the virtual DBS significantly um, increased the firing rate of the thalamus. Going back towards the normalization, of uh, brain activity going back towards the control, if you might say so. So this is the first trend that we could see that is validating this disinhibition of the thalamus through DBS, which is well known from literature of spiking networks before. But we only, we only are looking now here at these uh, average firing rates, right? And you might say, so, okay, but why do we need the spikes and how do they look like? And of course we have more. We can look at all these single spikes now. We can open up our, simulated virtual brain, and we can see exactly why the thalamus is um, kind of reacting this way to the stimulus. And here you can see, for example, that to the biphasic stimulus, the red line is the point where we give the virtual stimulus. Then the thalamus first is inhibited, nothing's happening there, but then it's probably what we call post-inhibition bursting of the thalamus that's happening and increasing the thalamic firing rate. And you see that these bursts, the synchronized bars of firing of the neurons are happening here. So, and you see that they probably come from this phase of the STN, which is receiving the biphasic stimulus. And you can go and analyze in more detail different parts of these raster plots, which we have done in the paper, and, and try to not look at it too long to hurt your eyes, trust me. But it's a really nice uh, way of now seeing very details of what's happening with TVB multiscale inside the basal ganglia. What's the direct reaction to the stimulus that we simulate? But that's not all. That's something people have looked at before. That's something that we were happy that we could reproduce, but we have now more. 
simultaneously to all these spikes, we can see regional activity, right? Of the, all of the cortical regions that we simulated, which were actually all of the ones that were not gray. So the gray ones here were not included in the Peterson Atlas. So unfortunately in this first study, we could not uh, see their reaction to the stimulus. So and later on, I will show you a different video where you can see the whole brain. Of course, that was one of our first things to improve. But this detailed atlas is giving us, um, for all of these other cortical regions, helps us to simulate their activity. So what can we see here? We have, first of all, compared resting state of the patient and the control. And we have seen that clearly the control has here a blue color in the postcentral gyrus, which is meaning that in the resting state already they differ in the postcentral gyrus and the control has more activity there. So that's for resting state, okay. And we say, okay, so let's see when we switch on the electrode, what's happening and we can actually see that the postcentral gyrus after switching on the electrode, what's red means it's increased activity due to the stimulus, that the postcentral gyrus even turns black here, right? So it's really um, normalizing again, the activity of the postcentral gyrus, our virtual simulation which was nice to see that the patient, remember this brain state space, is going closer to the control. All right, so what else can we see? There are lots of options. We can see all the frontal regions here being quite red, meaning that their activity is increased due to different uh, forms of our stimulus in all of the three cases that we tried. And now you wanna ask yourself, how is that actually relating to literature, right? So we looked at the top five regions that were most activated by our virtual stimulus. And we saw that the middle frontal gyrus was one of them and the other frontal region as well. We saw in literature that the middle frontal gyrus also when you put patients in the MRI and you record fMRI activity, is one that has the biggest shift of activity from DBS off to DBS on. So in line with measured fMRI activity of the patient. And also the insula, for example, was among those top five regions, which is actually strongly linked to non-motor symptoms. So that was exactly what we were looking for, uh, that we find now also the activity of other regions further away that are potentially responsible um, for side effects or other things that DBS, that we know DBS causes, but we don't quite yet understand why. All right, and then we see also some blue areas here which is a reduced activity due to the stimulation, which was quite interesting to us. We see that in the supplementary motor area, which is also known to be impaired in Parkinson's disease, and where they first now tried TMS of this region and saw that it improved freezing of gait in Parkinson patients. So again, related to a specific symptom in this region and uh, known to be impaired in Parkinson's disease. So it was, kind of a validation for us from literature, at least that we saw this activity that we simulate makes sense. So as a summary of what we did in our study, one could say that we constructed a virtual DBS model with TVB mod scale and produced realistic firing behavior and resting state and using different uh, stimuli. And what is now the cool thing about the model is that it can work in Anarchy, it can also work with Nest. We have a version that we are working on right now that will have the same network, but then simulated with Nest. But both things are already implemented in the TVB multi-scale environment that we used last week already. And the plus points are now that we can observe cortical effects, even though we have um, also the spiking effects, right? So we have the best of both worlds. And we have a flexible model that can um, be tuned for the individual to test different stimuli. You can get give in any stimulus shape or form that you like if the model, right? And it's now more realistic in terms of space because the activity driving of the spiking network, for example, is not coming anymore from this one region called cortex, but it's coming from the different cortical regions through the fibers of the connectome, which is more realistic. And in terms of timing, it's also more realistic because it's not just a Poisson process anymore that's generating spikes that is driving the network, but it's the realistic mean field activity of all the cortical regions that is driving our spiking network. 
So all of our code is online on GitHub. And we will actually take a look now at um, how that code looks like in detail and dive a little bit in of how you can also then create your own use case, TV multi-scale or your own stimulus in a more realistic manner. So the ideal case to look at the code is through the app, the TVB nest minus dev apps hbp.eu. And you can find if you navigate um, through TVB nest examples, examples, TVB anarchy notebooks, my at all this notebook, um, you can find this notebook and you can run it. Uh, unfortunately, we still have some anarchy dependency issues there that we are right now fixing, should be fixed very soon. And then you can do it through this app as well. But for now, I will show you locally how it looks like. Let me do this. Um, so let me show you in the app. So in the app as well, I open it. Yeah. So it will look something like this uh, if you have it open on eBrains. And uh, everything will work fine to a certain point where it will complain about some newest energy version things, but we are going to fix that. So in a couple of days, we will be able to do it here. And for now, I set it up locally, which you can do as well. And after the course, I will provide the manual that you can set up TVB multi scale also locally if you haven't done so yet. It works through Docker, which is like a virtual machine thing on your computer. So it's nicely reproducible and containerized pipeline to set it up. And uh, if you are like, okay, I haven't set up anything. I still want to see the code. Where do I find it? This is the notebook that we were going through now. I will put it in the chat. That is just available on GitHub, right? And you can see there are also the plots and outputs of that model and everything. So if you open that next to it, uh, you can also download it however you prefer and um, you can follow along now, which when I go shortly um, a bit through the code and dive into how is now I talked about results, I talked about methods, right? And how is it all coming together in this one notebook? All right, so <clears throat> we have some equations defined again for your convenience that we are using the spiking network of Ivikovich. We're using NFP, and it's mainly the Zikovich model about the membrane potential, and you have a recovery variable. So the first things are just importing a bunch of stuff, of course, setting your paths, where can I find the data that is also put online now. So the whole study is reproducible because all the data is online, all the op also the optimized weights of this one control and one patient. So you are able to rerun everything here. And then um, you can set the data mode here. So it's now set to patient. So we will look at the result of the patient, but you can easily change it to control and then you will simulate the control. And this is where we have the simulated weights. All right, this is set up, okay. So if it's the patient, put this scaling, if it's a control, same global coupling, but slightly different interface vectors. These are the interface vectors. Um, and then simulation length, it's milliseconds, so 1,500. You have a transient uh, that we kind of cut out. We say, okay, the first 500, it's, it's uh, put it before just to get everything settled in terms of activity. And let's start the stimulus at 400 milliseconds, which is exactly the same as you can see on the paper results. And then here is the simulation mode and RS is for resting state. So we will now simulate just the resting state and you can also put it to stim and then you simulate with the stimulus. Yeah? So in the first cell, it's always nice, right? To have already the options that you only need to change something in the first cell to then execute the whole notebook and uh, find the results just below. And you have different targets, as I said, we have the STN or the GPI. And also then we have a simple stimulus on the GPI. It will be just a simple inhibitory stimulus that we send to the GPI. And for the STN, we have two options, the biphasic or the monophasic stimulus. So depending on which one you choose here, you can change the settings as well. You see the frequency, for example, in clinics often use 
130 hertz and we have here 130 and we will now use the monophasic stimulus that has 120 um, so quite close to realistic clinical setting and a duration of 0 0.3 milliseconds so quite short so then it tells you about the output path and uh, if you set the flex to true you will have lots of figures actually um, and uh, yes some plotting so now it comes to load Doing everything that we have, the data that I talked about, this loads the structural data, which is first of all the optimized weights, and then the normative collector. And you remember this hybrid structure, right, that I showed you before, that will together be like a little bit individual and the rest of the brain normative collector. So we import important things. And then we will actually uh, say, okay, we want these weights from the Naive et al. study for, in our network, all the connections inside the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia, short BG, right? So you see the optimized weights here being extracted from the data. And they always have a weight and also they have a probability in the spiking network, which gives you a connection probability between the two populations of neurons. So that's all optimized in the previous study. So we just took it once for the patients and once for the control. We load all of these parameters in. And you can see them here printed out. Okay, so GPI to GPE, for example, has a probability connection of 0 0.32 that would go into our energy code into the spike net. So we also need a connectome, right? This normative one which you can find in connectivity dennis text, And uh, the centers are in this file, and the track lengths are just Euclidean distances of the centers, actually. You can find them in the separate file. You can find those files on GitHub in the data folder. All right, and then we do some stuff because now we have these two connectomes coming together, the optimized rates and the other one. And what do we need to do is to delete the double structures because thalamus we have in the spiking network already and we also had a thalamus in the other connectome. So we want to get rid of one of these thal thalami and we'll leave the spiking one and we will delete the one of the connectome. These are all modeling choices, right? That uh, anybody can explore in more detail and see how much effect this had or not but we just thought two thalami for example makes no sense to us and we rather want the spiking one because it's a more realistic one okay we removed some connections between the cortex and thalamus for example and so on why did we do such stuff because if we look back for a second at our network we wanted to make sure that whatever comes in here goes through the spiking network before it is transported out so we deleted some connections, which are also often thought of as false positive, for example, from the polygon to the cortex. And uh, we left from thalamus only outgoing connections towards the, the cortex, because we really wanted it to be realistic in the sense that the thalamus is the output of the basic. So you can see some manipulations uh, or preparations of the connectome. And when it all comes together, it will look like here you have GPE, GPI, STN, striatum, and thalamus, which are filled up with individual weights. And then you have the rest, which is filled with the Peterson connector. And as I said already, the Peterson is going for all the basic ganglia connections towards cortical area and mostly frontal and motor. So you see, for example, the cerebellum has uh, no play in here. It's just there will be an isolated node. Nothing will be happening there because we don't have it connected in our network. So the track length, we can calculate from any region to any other region, right? And it will look quite homogeneously distributed. Then we will focus only on the left hemisphere, by the way. So why did we do that? Because the previous paper of Maid et al, the spiking network treated the two hemispheres in isolation. Um, so there was no optimization of the interhemispheric connection. So that's another um, point to improve our, our next work is to, of course, include both hemispheres. But luckily for us in the literature, they found that the basal ganglia in Parkinson 
once it's not working the way it's supposed to be, it seems to be quite symmetric on both sides. That's why you often also see that the settings of the DBS electrodes are similar right and left hemisphere. All right, so again, we are scaling a bit the connections here. This is a global scaling factor and the interface factor is going back and forth. So you can see here, for example, from the G, right, coming back. Then you can see that we use the reduced Wang Wang model uh, with some uh, default uh, model parameters and use Hoyne stochastic integrator. You should know this one, right? Integration step was 0 0.1 milliseconds. And we monitor just the raw uh, activity, so the neural activity of each region. We set the delays according to the track length. And we gave also in some initial conditions that file is also online. Um, because we figured after some simulations, it's better if you start already with uh, certain initial conditions and don't start random. All right, so the connectome use then eventually for simulations looks a little bit different because we wanted to adjust this uh, basal ganglia weights with the rest just for visualization purposes that they are quite similar. And now we need as a second step after loading all the structural data, we need uh, to build and connect the Anarchy network, which is our spiking network, right? So for that, we need to import Anarchy and we need to set the first nodes, five nodes will be spiking. And then we have a builder that does everything for us. There will be the simulator inside, it will be configuration inside and everything. But you can also, so that uses all the default parameters, but if we now below uncommented, we can change those default parameters. We can uh, play a bit with it. So the population order, which is the size of our population, are 200 neurons for each region. And then the parameters, as I said previously, from each region of the basal ganglia and the spiking network, they differ a little bit, uh, which comes from literature a bit and from observations in different uh, primate studies, mouse studies, and so on. So here you can see that this is once the default parameter setting, then it's always slightly changed. So for example, the inhibitory populations will have slightly different parameters and excitatory ones, and the striatome will be a special case. All of this information is taken from the Oliver Maid study um, that we cite in the paper, which is previously optimized and showed that these settings were giving us realistic fMRI data. All right, so we need to uh, give some indices to which uh, node will be what. We have the GPE with its inhibitory population, GPI is inhibitory, STN and thalamus will be excitatory, and striatum again will be inhibitory. We will set the parameters here for the excitatory, inhibitory population. And then you can see once here how such a population is set. For example, all excitatory ones will be set with these parameters. There will be these indices and a scale, which is just scale one. So nothing happens when you multiply with one, but you can could play with it and scale one population up and one down and so on. So um, lots of things you could change here and play with. And then um, we have the rule of all to all connectivity which will allow connection from all neurons in the one population to all neurons in the other population. There we also just followed the lead of the previous paper. And then we have these probabilities that will come in, which are also optimized. Okay, so how does it look if we now need to define a connection? In TV models, we need to define a source and a target. This is a self-connection, for example. You need to define what's your synapse model and how will you define the connectivity, how will be the delay, and how will be the weight, what will be the receptor type, which is here gamma, self-inhibitory connections, and so on. So if you set from here to here, this is defining one connection. And we, as you've seen with the arrows of this network, quite a lot. So I will skip some part that we will be setting connections. Connections, connections, lots of connections that you define all singular, uh, singularly, and uh, which gives you lots of um, creativity, let's say, 
change a spiking network here inside the UV multiscale as well. It doesn't come all the way from the outside and needs to be fixed, but you can also adjust it later. Okay, so then we have some monitors for the spikes, which are important. We don't only want average activity there, we want really every spike to be recorded. Okay, monitors again. And that's the model builder that will have all of these inputs together to then build the spiking network. And it's building, it's building. And you can see lots of printout, it's created. Then the population sizes are printed again, just to be sure, as I said, everywhere 200 neurons. Okay, then the Anarchy network here also will have the stimulus will be defined inside Anarchy. Why? Because the stimulus is given to STN or GPI, which are inside the spiking network. So the monophasic stimulus is um, explicitly defined here and the equations here as well. Uh, so in any case, that's a nice thing. You can directly put in equations and it will interpret them nicely. You're not uh, bound by anything predefined. You can just be created yourself, uh, create, creative yourself. And for the biphasic stimulus, we also use different equations, more realistic ones. These were from a prior study. The justifications for all of these choices are in the paper. So I will leave that out for now. And then you have also a synthesis stimulus to the GPI, which is basically just an inhibitory population that we connect with the GPI, that's inhibiting GPI for a certain time point. That's how we implemented that stimulus. Okay, we need the interface, right? First, the structural data, second, the spiking network, and now we interface it. And that is as simple as using these few lines here to bring the reduced one one model together with the NMK model. And we will define it with rates. So that means, as I said before, firing rates are sent back and forth. And we will allow back and forth connectivity from anarchy to TVB and from TVB to anarchy. And this part is all already up there. It's just if you want to change it, um, you would uncomment. And now we simulate. And you can see the compilation is quite fast. Then there's a lot of printout for you to be able to check if everything went well in the setting. I should not click on this. Okay, let's not look through all the printout. That can be quite handy when you really want to know what's going on step by step. And now let's get the time series and plot them. So we have recorded. And we have recorded also, yeah, I, I skipped a few parts, sorry for that. I was scrolling too long. Don't worry, we will find the place. Here are, previously, that's the average activity of all the regions inside TDB, for example, that is recorded. Have regions that was any, and this is their activity. Sorry, that was a bit too quiet. Can you say it again? Okay, maybe a mistake. Um, if not, just speak up a little louder, then I can hear you better. Um, okay, so these are the average activities of GPE, GPI, STN, so all the regions we modeled in a higher detail. And you can see they're doing quite some stuff, even though this is a patient resting state, right? And it's plotted all of their state variables. And now we also have these spike graphs across again. So quite small, so in the paper they're a bit enlarged, of course. But you can see here that the dark gray lines is kind of an average bar. And when this dark gray is high, you can see there's lots of firing going on. So lots of plotting options here. And then we also calculated the mean spike rates, which are the ones that we use for this green plot that I'll show here again. So for this, we just computed the mean spike rate, which is also inside the notebook, more raster plots and more, more, more plotting possibilities because we left everything in so that you can also use the same visualizations as we did and really see 
the reproducibility that um, when you want to use it for your own study and you want a different plotting, uh, be our guest and do some plotting. Okay, and that was it for looking a bit into the code. Um, I admit, uh, so in the code there are lots of comments, but I admit that it's probably not um, not so obvious uh, sometimes, but if you have questions to the code, don't hesitate to contact me and Dionysius and we will help you and explain you um, how we did it, uh, why we did it exactly. So it was of course a lot of work and I will not say that TVB Moscow is the easiest part of TVB, but it's worth it as you have seen since you then have really the whole picture of the two scales that you might need for some of your use cases and also to find out about diseases that are especially um, prone to be used for multi-scale and that you know there's something happening at the receptor level and there's something happening on the large scale level as well. So um, for these cases, it's quite a great resource. All right, so now we have talked a lot about how to simulate it in more detail and what comes out. And now, of course, comes an outlook to the future. And let's see if uh, what we could do there. You might have your own ideas now. Um, so, of course, uh, feel free to do whatever you, <laughs> you want. This is just my view of future directions. So one direction that I personally am going right now is to combine TVB as well with another software called LeapDBS by Andy Horn, which is a software that's really localizing after the surgery, where was the electrode implanted and giving us very precisely this location of the electrode so that we could use as well for very precise simulation. Because so far our stimulus was coming in and it was applied as you have seen in the code to the whole region of STN or GPI and to all the neurons uniformly. Meaning that it was not caring at where the neurons are placed in space, but it was really attacking, let's say, or stimulating all neurons um, similarly. And that's not very realistic. We know that sometimes the electrode is placed a little bit out, a little bit in, right? And then not the whole STN is, um, is targeted, but only the motor part, for example, which we want, by the way, and not the limbic part or the associative part so much. So we want to simulate the higher detail. We want to see that we can use that information of LeapDBS, the precise location of the electrode, to then make our simulations in that area even a higher, more re resolution, and even higher resolution. So there would be like three levels of multi-scale, but okay, let's not get <laughs> too much detail there. So how would that look like? So this is ongoing work, um, and published and in preparation. Um, so we have here the precise location of an electrode that we have gotten as from an exemplary uh, patient from Andy Horn and Nandita. And there we have the precise 3D location of the lead. And we have a normative connectome, a normative tractogram around the electrode. So um, this data can be the Peterson et al. data. And now here we use actually the HPC data which is giving us a precise location of all the fibers. Because if you want to do it right, you need to take into account not only where exactly the electrode was placed, but which fibers exactly it activates, not just the whole region and the whole connection, but much more fine-grained, let's say. So if we do that, and then we calculate the electric field around this electrode, sorry, oh, it's gone, you're gone. But I can see that you can still see me, that's good. Just don't know how to stop sharing later on, <laughs> okay. Um, so here you can see um, that we can calculate, as many people did before, an electric field around the electrode because often two contacts are used and there is an electric field created with a certain voltage and that's looking like a sphere, but it is of course altered by the fibers. So if you also take into account the fibers and what they're doing to the conductor, conductivity, you can get uh, use other models from other fields or electric field studies um, to get quite a realistic picture of which fibers are actually activated. And we adapted this code uh, from a recent publication from Ahmed Al, where they used 
this higher resolution version of taking into account the location of the electrode and all the fibers for a study on doing virtual DBS for treatment resistant depression patients. So we adjusted it for our Parkinson case. And then we use that input and to say which fibers are then activated. And then we accumulated those fibers at all the cortical regions and said, okay, if I'm a cortical region and lots of activated fibers come to me, my stimulus weighting will be really high. So, and then we use the first um, very basic TVD simulation of the 2D generic oscillator that then gave us um, an overview of what happens when we now put this stimulus that's coming from these precise electrode location, the precise fiber location, and then we simulate with the stimulus. This is what's time averaged and on minus off, so stimulus on minus off. But it's, I think, nicer to see if we look at the video that is showing us the membrane potential of all the regions and its change. So when you have the deep after the transient, you have the DBS off. You can see here some slide, um, light red, light blue, resting state activity. And until at 1,500, our is switched on. And now you can see that the colors are getting brighter and uh, darker actually, that more is happening. Let's watch it again. First resting state. And now the stimulus is switched on. So also with your bare eye, you can see that this is now a whole brain picture because it's the, all the fibers of the human connectome project data. And you can see that the stimulus is really towards, um, also, as you can see here, having quite an effect on the temporal regions which were left out in our previous study, right? And now came back in again. And when we um, look at the on minus off periods and we subtract them from each other and normalize it, you can see there's a lot going on in motor, but there's quite something going on in front of still, but also the temporal lobe should not be forgotten. This is the data of one individual Parkinson's disease patient, just to show you uh, like uh, where this is heading and how we can take into account even more detail into the same simulation. All right. So that was it from what I'm doing. Now uh, let's look at other studies. For example, um, quite some time ago already, people have looked at this whole brain perspective without the spiking. The Deco lab and Wenger and Al looked in 2017, for example, from a dynamical systems perspective. And they fitted their network and they said, okay, so DBS, how does it bring the uh, bifurcation point closer or further away? And how is it actually, um, working is it working more towards the critical point of the brain or not and uh, i encourage you to look into this study if you more want to approach it from this dynamical systems perspective because they're doing a great job there without spicing but looking at all the regions and fmri data of dbs on and off and then there are quite a lot of interesting developments in other fields that we should look out for that are coming more and more. So we, you know that we can use much higher TESA data for mice and that they, they have already implanted electrodes made out of graphene, which um, gives much less um, artifacts to our fMRI measurements. And we can much more precisely track with a, for example, realistic 130 Hertz stimulation where this is in the fMRI actually being activated and how it looks like if we activate this or that network with different electrodes because now we have like this yeah metal electrode in an mri as you know that creates artifacts but with graphene there is hope and we can have a much higher resolution but so far not in humans there are startups though that are working on this and uh, very exciting as well is that the whole the whole field of deep brain simulation it's moving away from this one setting that's optimal. And an adaptive closed loop simulation, right? And maybe you know control theory that you have like a control variable that is then influencing giving feedback, setting new parameters that are maybe much better for now because the patient now is sleeping. She or he 
will have different brain activity. So now we need a new setting. And in this way, it can control um, the electrode. And how is that possible? It's because we have new an electrode, right? So that means they can read and record the activity surrounding the electrodes, and at the same time decide whether to change the setting uh, to activate different effects or how to do that. So. That's quite exciting stuff, and it's called uh, closed loop or adaptive DBS. And how they do it currently is uh, by measuring just the beta band, um, beta band, beta frequency band power peak. So um, if you have lots of beta uh, frequency activity as a Parkinson patient, which is often a hallmark of Parkinson in the STN. Then the stimulus is uh, switched on to suppress this beta activity specifically because they have found quite a good relation between this beta activity and the STN and the motor impairment in Parkinson's disease patients. So whenever this comes up now, they are able to then switch on the electrode, which is most likely the faulty activity in the Parkinson disease patient's brain. All right, so. Um, this gives us this opportunity. If we just have this uh, simple measure of beta activity in the STN, we can control for it. So of course, thinking back to TVB, you could think like, hmm, okay, maybe that's not giving us the whole picture or, or is it, right? So they're starting now the first trials with this adaptive DBS. It's going really well, but of course there's always room for improvement. That's at least what I think. That you can also take into account side effects and maybe see if we can be more than beta if we can go beyond beta and figure some other figure out some other biomarker that can also be important to control the DBS design. All right, so we talked a little bit about how we could improve this in the future, taking into account more the higher resolution around the electrode, placing the electrode pre more precisely, activating only the fibers that are really activated, so making things around the electrode more precise. And also from the medical point of view of this adaptive DBS, uh, that we can control for it. And another thing that I, the last point I want to talk to you about is how can we do it for other neuromodulation therapies? Because there's so much more out there. Um, so the FDA approvals, for example, came already in for DBS for essential tremor and Parkinson disease. Um, but there is more, there is focused ultrasound, there is a lesioning, there is TMS, there is TDCS. And for example, TMS has been approved from the, by the FDA already for major depression and OCD. And it's coming more and more. So we need to keep up with our modeling as well. And we need to be ready to implement other things as well. And for example, we have a colleague that's working on implementing TMS inside TDB. Um, going towards the non-invasive therapy, because often DBS is not taken um, as a therapy by patients because it's quite risky eh? and it sounds quite scary. It's a, a long surgery and the outcome is not guaranteed and TMS is non-invasive. It's a repetitive treatment often that you come back and back and it's this magnetic coil that's placed over the brain that's also altering your brain activity and seems to work very well at the moment for depression, uh, treatment resistant depression, for example, in combination with cognitive therapy. And here you can see that this is actually probably the way to go because it's quite invasive version of sticking the electrode in with a, with a very humongous surgery and so on. It's not what the patients would most like. So they prefer non-invasive often, understandably, and uh, the non-invasive also gives us more freedom to also put uh, healthy controls with this non-invasive, right? To have these controls and have uh, te treatment tested there, which we cannot do with uh, DBS, of course. And uh, there is another technique called TDCS, or transcranial direct current stimulation, which was already implemented, for example, by a previous co um, colleague, Spiegler and Kunze, inside TBB where they use the connectome as well that we know, and then they recorded scalp EEG, and they also use an electric field that is generated here due to, due to the device of TDCS. And they've compared their findings of functional connectivity 
doing rest and stim on and stim off um, with findings from literature. And I found that this was making quite a good use case. And they used the default connectivity of TVB, which is at your, um, at your hand as well, which you can use as well. OK, and then just some last remarks that here you can see we have already a study that you have heard about previously by Leon of the pharmacological intervention and how this is then using TVB to um, slow uh, the EG signal of Alzheimer's here, for example. Then we have now the study on DBS, and soon they will be following a study on TMS. And the future of brain stimulation, just to make some remarks, is probably not this. And the neuralizer, for example, if you know it from Men in Black, right? This is how people envision the future, but so far we are basically stuck here, where we don't know yet how it works. So we need quite a lot of more hard work on this um, interdisciplinary research to really understand how once in the future we can use such devices to the best. Um, yeah, let's say uh, the best outcome for patients. And also maybe it will enhance our intellectual abilities, who knows? And uh, I mentioned some things just to sum up. Uh, adaptive CPS is probably the future. Non-invasive, maybe in combination with invasive therapies will be the future in my opinion. Modeling assisted, I really hope for it. There will be real-time control of, of an AI probably. Um, that is a personal choice if you want that in your brain or not. And there need to be individual level solutions, not just on the group level anymore. We need to have multimodal monitoring. So we need to monitor a patient, not just in the fMRI, but also uh, EEG activity, also LFPs of the electrode and so on. And of course, um, multi-scale modeling to understand what's happening, not just at one, but at multiple scale. And here, and just to make a last remark, um, if you look, for example, at printed circuit boards in the 1970s, and you look at it now, and you compare how long DBS is out there, and you look in printed circuit board development from only 2014 till 2016, you see that the technology actually, which is behind DBS, more or less, um, all this technology is, uh, in, is there at our disposal, is advancing so fast that um, clinical practice is not yet keeping up. They are trying, startups are trying, and so on, that we replace this outdated technology um, with the newest up-to-date things, but we need to be really sure there need to be lots of clinical trials, right? So it is um, just to give you a perspective on what's there to come and that this can be as tiny as this. Okay, and Everything can be run today also on your local computer. I left it slide in and quite a lot of references for your um, yeah, convenience that you can look at and check out if you want to know more about the topic. For me, I think it's quite exciting. Uh, I hope that I have brought you also to some excitement about neuromodulation, what's there to come, and that you should follow what's coming in the next years. Not to cure diseases, but maybe, you know, and improve our mood or stop that you're tired. Or, okay, uh, that's too much philosophy for now. Now it's question time. I'm happy to take any questions and I think we can stop the recording, Leon. Thanks for your attention.